Hello and welcome, I'm your Code Monkey. So Bitcoin is very popular nowadays along with all kinds of crypto like Ethereum, DeFi, NFTs and so on. Behind all of that is the blockchain technology which is still a mystery to a lot of people. It's pretty complex but also very interesting and once it clicks then everything starts to make sense. So I've been researching Bitcoin and blockchain for the past few months and I made this nice demo to help solidify my own knowledge and to help you understand how all of this works. I'm going to start from the most basic scenario possible and slowly introduce more and more concepts until the whole blockchain system comes clear. There are chapters in the video if you want to skip around, but if you really want to learn then it's best to watch the whole thing. And the demo that I will be using here is also available on the website as well as the project files in case you want to dig deeper yourself. Alright, so first let's just define some basic terms. Now Bitcoin is one specific cryptocurrency that uses the blockchain to keep track of ownership. And blockchain is the technology which, like the name implies, chains a bunch of blocks together which contain whatever data you want. The chain from block to block is based on some very complex algorithms which is what gives it security. Now the key point is Bitcoin does not equal blockchain. Bitcoin is simply one of the many possible use cases for blockchain technology. For example, you might have heard of NFTs. Well, that is another type of use case for blockchain technology that has absolutely nothing to do with Bitcoin. In the case of NFTs, the underlying network might be, for example, the Ethereum network, which allows for smart contracts to be created. But again, for now, let's stick with the basics. So how does the blockchain work? Now to understand it, I made this nice demo and we're going to go step by step. So on my first demo here, I really just have a text box. Now, like I said, the blockchain can store any kind of data. So in the case of Bitcoin, this would be some data like, for example, Alice sends Bob 10 BTC. Or for example, in the case of Ethereum, this could be a smart contract. Or in the case of NFT, this would be some unique ID. Data is really just data. Remember how the blockchain can be used for anything. It doesn't have to be just Bitcoin or just money. So for now, let's ignore everything related to transactions or wallets or money of any kind. In the end, everything is just data. So here as a type of data, I just have some text. So now we introduce the concept of a hash. So first, what is a hash? Well, a hash is essentially a signature for some data. Now, if I type something in here, like for example, hello world, I get down here the calculated hash based on this data. So as you can see, it starts with A591. Now, importantly, the same data will always result in the same hash. So if I erase this and I type hello world again, yep, I get the exact same hash. Another very important thing about hashes is if I make just one tiny change, then the output should completely change. So for example in here, if I just change the W from uppercase into lowercase, yep, there you go, I get a completely different hash. So if the data changes in any way, no matter how small, the hash is completely different. So keep that in mind as we go along. Also, different cryptos use different hashes. Like for example, Bitcoin uses SHA-256, whereas Ethereum uses ETHash, but the logic behind how the hashes are used is mostly the same. So with this, we now have a simple block. We just got some data and some hash. And then we can have multiple blocks. And like the name implies, it's a blockchain, so the next step is to chain these blocks. So here it is. Now the way they are chained together is that each block contains the hash of the previous block. So this block has this calculated hash, then the second block takes that hash as an input, then this calculated hash goes into the previous one on this one, and so on. Now one important part is the very first one. This one, there's no previous block, so this is what is called the genesis block. It's a very special first block on the blockchain, which has a special value on the previous hash, and all the others, they contain the hash of the previous block. Now also note how the hash is calculated. So it's a hash of the data on the block, but also the previous hash. So previously, all the blocks with the same data had the same hash, but now since the hash is calculated along with the previous hash, if I type in the exact same thing, here all blocks have the exact same data, but since the hash is calculated not just on the data, but the data plus the previous hash, you can see that the final hashes are completely different. So all the blocks are chained together. They all have a link to the previous hash on the previous block. Now again, remember that the purpose of a hash is to work as a signature for the data contained in the block, the data plus the previous hash. So that means that if I modify this block, I get a different hash, and now this second block also needs to have a different hash here. So that means that if I modify this block, then this hash has to be recalculated since the data changed, and in turn it makes this block incorrect, which breaks the whole chain. So this is how the blockchain is immutable. 
Immutable simply means that it cannot change, it cannot mutate, it cannot modify into something else. Once the data is recorded on the blockchain, it cannot be changed or else the whole blockchain breaks. The only way to modify the blockchain is to essentially recalculate all of the hashes on the entire blockchain, which, as we will soon see, it's essentially an impossible task. So now that we have a blockchain working, we move on to the next level. One very important concept about Bitcoin and pretty much all of crypto is decentralization, meaning that the blockchain does not exist on just one central authority, but instead everyone has a copy of the blockchain. So that means that, for example, if this user is nefarious and tries to modify the blockchain, even if this user manages to recalculate the hashes in order to make a valid blockchain, all of the other users will see it and the consensus wins, so the network as a whole simply ignores the nefarious actor. So in this case, there are two users with the blockchain on this state, and then there's one user on a different state. So two versus one, two wins, so this one is the actual valid state for the blockchain. So as new users join the network, the first thing they do is get a copy of the entire blockchain, then those users can go and verify all of the hashes to ensure that all of the data on the blockchain is valid and has not been tampered with. And as soon as that new user starts to receive the latest blocks, it can verify the hash in the previous hash to confirm that it does have the valid correct blockchain. So next up, how blocks are added. Now in order to add it, the user creates a block with whatever data it should have. So for example, in the case of Bitcoin, it would add pending transactions as the data. So for example, Alice sends Bob 10 BTC. So that's the data that is going to be created on this block. Then it adds the hash to the previous block in order to make the link. And then it calculates the final hash based on the previous and the data contained in this block. And then it simply broadcasts that block onto the entire network. Again, this is how it's decentralized. This is a peer-to-peer -peer system. So there's no centralized server anywhere. This user creates the block, then it tells this user and this user, then in turn this one tells this one and so on. So the next block gets propagated throughout the network throughout its users. Now, of course, if anyone can add blocks by just pressing a button, then that would make it way too easy for a nefarious actor to take over the network and generate a whole bunch of fake blocks. If you could recalculate all of the hashes of the entire blockchain in an instant, then it wouldn't be secure at all. So that's where the concept of mining and proof of work comes in. In order to create a new block on the network, a user, or rather a miner, does indeed create a new block with whatever data and link to the previous block, but then it also adds one more thing called the nonce. So this is just a normal number, and this number is used in collating the final hash. So as you can see, the final hash now is composed of the previous hash, the data for this block, and the nonce value. Now the important thing is that the final hash here, in order to be considered valid, it has to have a certain number of starting zeros. So as a new block gets added into the pending pool, so again, for example, Ellis sends Bob 10 BTC, that one gets added on the pending block, then in order for this to be added into the blockchain, the miner really starts mining. And what that means is that the miner must go through all kinds of numbers until it finds one that makes the final hash start with a certain number of zeros. So that's what mining is. It's really just a computer, or rather tons of computers, so all of the miners on the network, all of them trying all different kinds of numbers until the first one finds a valid number. When a miner finds a nonce that generates a valid hash, then it gets broadcasted to all of the miners and gets added onto the blockchain. And the number of zeros here is essentially the difficulty setting on the puzzle. So if I set a low difficulty, so less number of zeros on the starting hash, then it means that the miners will find a valid result very quickly. So there you go, that one with three starting zeros. It took 11,000 tries in order to find a valid hash, but this one with just two zeros, it only took 400 tries. So if you lower the difficulty, then the miners find the valid result very quickly. And if you set it higher, then obviously it takes more tries in order to find a valid result. Now in the context of Bitcoin, this difficulty is dynamically adjusted based on the number of active miners on the network in order to ensure that each block takes on average 10 minutes to mine. So as more miners join the network, the difficulty goes up, and if miners leave the network, then the difficulty goes down. So what we have here is what's called proof of work. That is because when a miner broadcasts a new node onto the network, all of the users on that network can validate and verify that this nonce does indeed generate a valid final hash. And they know that the only way the miner found that valid nonce was by trying out tons and tons of them one by one. So the fact that the miner found the valid nonce is proof that a certain amount of work has been put into it. Also one key point here is that it's very difficult to find a valid hash. Essentially you have to try every single possible number until you find a valid one. So that takes a ton of work. However, it's very easy to validate a hash. Once you know all of the values, you can very easily calculate the hash of all of this and verify that this nonce with this data and this previous hash does indeed generate this final hash. So it's hard to generate, but easy to verify. 
Now, just one note here about users and miners. So a user is anyone who is using the network. So anyone who has a wallet and wants to do some sort of transaction. So a user itself doesn't actually need to have a full copy of the blockchain. The user simply says, I want to do a transaction and sends the transaction onto the pending pool. And then the miners, they are really just machines simply running the mining software. Those then go into the pending pool, they grab all the transactions in there, they do the mining work and create a new valid block. So the key point is you don't have to be a miner in order to simply use the network. Now, based on how the network is decentralized and you have tons of miners all over the world, all of them trying to solve the same puzzle, eventually it will happen that two miners come up with two different valid solutions at the exact same time. Because again, this is just a nonce, so there isn't just one valid solution, there's tons of them. So when two of them find a valid solution at the exact same time, when that happens, it creates a fork on the blockchain. Now, the blockchain cannot have forks, so one block must only lead into just one other. So the solution to that is to simply wait until more blocks are mined. Now, some miners will be mining on this block, so using this hash as the previous hash, and some miners will be mining on this fork, so using this hash as the previous one. And after one or more blocks are mined, then as a rule, the longest chain wins. Being the longest chain really means that it's the one with the most amount of work put into it. So the fact that this chain is valid and longer is proof that more work was put into it. So when that happens, the other fork is simply discarded as if it never existed. The network consensus is based on what the majority of the network agrees that is true. So once the majority of the network agrees that this is a true state of the blockchain, then everything keeps going from here on as normal. So that's another key point of the blockchain. It's a system that does not require trust on one individual or central authority. Trust comes by simply knowing that work has been put into the network. So as a new user comes into the network, maybe they will receive blockchain data from two peers and one of them sends this chain and another one sends this chain. That new user doesn't have to choose in order to trust one peer over another. It simply trusts that the longest chain is the one with the most amount of work put into it and considers that the true state of the blockchain. Now, the possibility of forks also has another implication with regards to security and truth on the network. So, let's say, for example, that on this fork, it includes a transaction to buy an item. So, for example, let's say that Alice wanted to buy something from Bob, and different miners can grab different transactions from the pending pool. So, again, let's say on this fork, it had this transaction, but on this one, it didn't have this one. It had something else. And now, let's say that Bob only happened to receive this fork. So, he sees the block. He sees that the block is valid which means that he received payment, so he ships the item right away. But then the miners continue working on the network and the fork is solved, and it just so happens that this one down here is the one that is selected. So that means that this one is now the true state of the network and this fork is discarded. So if, for example, this fork up here did include this transaction, but this one did not, well, that means that since this fork is discarded, then Bob never ends up receiving the payment, but Bob already shipped the package, so now he's screwed and there's nothing he can do about it. Now, this is not a bug, it's an inherent property of the way the blockchain works. What it means is that you cannot 100% trust as soon as a valid block is mined. So the transaction, Alice sends Bob 10 BTC, gets added onto the pending pool, then a miner mines it and adds it to the block. So this one is now valid on the blockchain, but again, it's a very recent block, so you cannot 100% trust it just yet. Since network consensus is based on the chain link, then the older the block is, the more you can trust it since there is more proof of work. So again, when it's the very last block, you can't trust it. When it's now the second block in the chain, then you can start to trust it a bit more. Then after three, maybe it's trustworthy. And when it's maybe five or six blocks behind, then at that point, you can be pretty confident that that is the true state of the network. Now let's try to understand how everything that we have set up here makes for a very secure system that cannot be modified. So here, for example, we have Ellis and Bob and a bunch more users on the network. Now, Ellis decides to send Bob 50 Bitcoins to buy a car or something. So Ellis sends Bob 50 BTC. So makes that transaction, adds it into the pending pool. Then a bunch of miners are going to mine it. They're going to find a found hash and they're going to add it to the blockchain. So everything is good. Now, Bob follows what I said in the last demo and only sends the car after the block is a couple of blocks old. So a bunch more blocks are mined and added onto the blockchain. And after a few have been added, now Bob finally sends the car. Now, as soon as Alice hears that Bob sent the car, now she tries to be sneaky and modify the blockchain and to only send just 10 bitcoins. So she goes into her own blockchain and modifies instead of sending 50, just sending 10. Now again, like we saw previously, modifying the data causes a change in the hash, which means that this node has to be mined all over again. And of course, since each hash is used in the next block, then all of these ones need to be mined again as well. 
And again, the network consensus is based on the longest chain. So what that means is that in order for Alice to cheat Bob and modify the blockchain, she would have to make modifications and mine all of these blocks herself before the entire rest of the network mines some more blocks. So what that means is that it's technically possible for Alice to modify the blockchain and cheat the system, but in order to do that, she would need to control the majority of the mining power on the network. This is what you might have heard referred to as a 51% attack. Essentially, if you controlled 51% of the network, then your fake chain would have more mining power, which would eventually surpass the real chain, which would in turn make your fake chain the real accepted chain. So this is what gives blockchain its security. Every block is completely immutable and cannot ever be modified as long as there is no single actor with the majority of control of the network. Which given the current size of the Bitcoin blockchain makes it pretty much impossible for someone to control that much mining power, which in turn makes it extremely secure. So when you put all of the steps that we just saw together, we end up with a basic working blockchain. Everything you see in the crypto space is really just various use cases built upon this same base. So for example, in the context of Bitcoin, the blockchain is used to store transaction data. You have wallets with some keys used to validate that you have access to a particular wallet with a particular amount of Bitcoins. Then you also have the rate at which Bitcoins are introduced into the system. They are given as rewards to miners. And after a fixed number of Bitcoins are created, then the network will transition to working on mining fees. Another popular network is the Ethereum blockchain, which instead of just transaction data, it also uses smart contracts to run code directly on the blockchain. The code can then do all kinds of things, like wait for a particular condition to be fulfilled and automatically transfer funds from one account to another. You might also have heard of NFTs, which again, they're just data stored on the blockchain. So in this case, it's a sort of unique token that represents ownership of a particular thing. So essentially with all of this, you now have a better understanding of how the basics of the blockchain works. You can now go and learn about some more advanced topics, like for example, how account balance works in Bitcoin. So what are wallets and what are public and private keys and how they are used to secure the wallet as well as signing transactions. You can also go research other consensus methods beyond proof of work. So proof of stake is one of the main alternatives, which has the huge benefit of massively cutting down on energy usage as compared to proof of work. Smart contracts, which is the main difference between Bitcoin and something like Ethereum. It's a way to run code directly on the blockchain. Tokenomics, which is how each cryptocurrency handles their token. So how new tokens enter the system, how or if they are burned, how much do the founders hold and so on. Layer two, which is how you build a blockchain on top of another blockchain in order to solve some transaction volume problems and so on. So as you can see, blockchain is a massive new technology. And if you want to go deeper, you can learn much more about it. Okay, so that's it. If this video helped you, then please hit the like button. It's a tiny thing, but it really does help. The more I learn about blockchain technology, the more I'm fascinated by all of the possible use cases. So definitely look forward to some more interesting blockchain videos in the future. All right, hope that's useful. Check out these videos to learn some more. Thanks to these awesome Patreon supporters for making these videos possible. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.